So thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are joining in from. Uh, my name is Prashant Koshwara, and uh, I'm super excited to be here to talk about a very uh, interesting and a hot topic, uh, ransomware, which is affecting all of us in some form or fashion today. And, you know, these attacks uh, have been increasing and have been causing a lot of uh, havoc within, you know, every industry that we can think of. Uh, we have an action plan. Uh, agenda today, we will be kind of talking about, you know, what ransomware is, how that, uh, you know, applies to cloud native applications, uh, you know, the solution that Trilio uh, has been developing, uh, you know, and it ha has uh, released and will be continuing to, you know, evangelize. Uh, we'll go through all of those pieces. And then finally, we'll do, uh, you know, some live and recorded demonstrations, a combination of two, you know, with uh, keeping time in mind. And then finally, we'll do some question and answers. So with that said, uh, you know, we'll start off with the slides that we have prepared for this talk. So what is ransomware? Based on the definition that you see out on the World Wide Web, uh, ransomware attacks are a type of a cyber attack where you know, malicious users get access to your data and they you know, hold it ransom. And obviously it's unauthorized access and uh, once they hold it ransom, they you know, basically ask you for money uh, to get the data back. Uh, and you know, there is no guarantee even after they ask you for that money and you pay it, that you're going to get your data back. So there are multiple ways they do this. They you know, either encrypt the data either from you or they you know, delete all your data and you know, make sure that you are kind of disabled in terms of business continuity. Now let's look at some of these stats that we see around ransomware these days, or you know, in general, what has what ransomware done? So there are 300 million cases of ransomware attacks each year, right? And as we mentioned earlier, you know, there is no guarantee that even after an attack, you pay these guys the ransom, they're going to give your data back. So you know, there is a big chance of permanent data loss. The cost of every ransomware attack has been going up significantly as, you know, time is moving forward. And what we see is that, you know, from uh, in the last uh, few years, the average cost of a ransomware attack has increased by 171% to 312K. Now this number 312K, the way it is uh, calculated is not only the amount that you have to pay back, but it also considers the, uh, you know, the loss that a business has to incur when their data is unavailable and when they're not able to service their customers. Now, you know, we are kind of in, you know, still in the middle of a pandemic, kind of getting out of it, but, you know, these attacks have pushed us all into this remote working uh, scenario. And as part of this remote working scenario, the number of attacks have definitely gone up. And this is, this is happening a lot because uh, you know, there are a lot many more devices that are come, uh, you know, connecting back into the corporate infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, one of the data points that we see is that, you know, mobile devices are driving up a lot of vulnerabilities, you know, a lot of point of entries are being, uh, you know, created uh, as part of these things. So, you know, this, this problem of ransomware, you know, as the world becomes more and more digitalized, which is, you know, going to happen, uh, the problem is, you know, always going to be there and you know even the ransomware attackers are getting smarter and smarter uh, by the day and you know using more specialized techniques to get into your uh, environments you know capture your data and you know kind of disable you in a way so we need a you know better solution and uh, you know definitely a concrete approach for combating all these uh, malicious users now with that said i have a poll question uh, you know based on the first slide that we saw, does your organization have a strategy for protecting your you know, Kubernetes-based application from ransomware attacks? Simple three options, yes, no, unsure. Um, so I'll just give everyone a you know, few seconds to answer. And uh, once we have the results, we can go kind of go through it. OK. 
Okay, I'm just gonna give a few more seconds. Okay. I think we cannot see the poll results right away, but uh, we will discuss that towards the end. Oh, actually, hold on, there it is. So the answers that we've received are 17% say yes, 33% say no, and 50% say unsure. And this is uh, exactly the kind of uh, you know, feedback that we were expecting. Uh, you know, a majority of folks being between the no and unsure space because you know, we all need to understand firstly, you know, is our protection the right protection or not? And then, you know, obviously folks who do not have protection, you know, definitely need to, you know, kind of uh, uh, introduce some checks and, you know, uh, protocols within your environment. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so thank you for answering that poll. We'll move forward. Now, when we look at uh, a Kubernetes-based environment, you know, there, is, there are multiple roles and multiple personas that are interacting with the Kubernetes system, right? Who are basically doing DevOps, you have your SREs, you have your admins, everyone, you know, kind of interfacing and interacting on the same uh, infrastructure. You know, we're going to start off with a few personas from the left to the right, you know, starting off from the inception or, you know, building and creation of uh, uh, data. So you have your developers and, you know, as the developers are writing code, their main uh, focus is, you know, faster application development, faster application delivery, and they want to test with production data, okay? Because they want to increase the success and the, you know, the uh, probability of uh, success of introducing new applications and launching new applications. Now, the developers like Lisa, they work with Brian. Now, Brian is the SRE who is focused on taking whatever Lisa does, you know, making sure that it's running properly within the uh, Kubernetes clusters, and uh, uh, he's using KitOps, you know, uh, all the uh, primary fundamentals around Kubernetes to deploy applications. Uh, however, you know, Brian is also concerned that, hey, is my application going to go down, whether it is, you know, maybe just data corruption, or maybe it could be security-related issues like ransomware. Um, so, you know, the problem is definitely starting from the development side as well. You know, dev SREs are also kind of thinking about this and the ransomware problem is uh, applicable to everyone. When we move on to the right, more onto the ops side where we have, you know, folks who are doing more on the infrastructure platform provisioning. Uh, we have Rob, you know, Rob is also doing kind of like SREs, but uh, SRE work, but he's focused more at the cluster level. He's also using, you know, GitOps principles to you know, deploy his clusters, infrastructure, as code, everything. Now his focus is also, you know, uh, making sure that the cluster is running successfully, no applications are suffering, and the security of the entire cluster is paramount to him as well, uh, making sure that he has business continuity. And then finally, we have Jane, who is, you know, you can think of Rob's manager, who focuses more on the, you know, uh, aspects around migration, data mobility, making sure, you know, overall business is healthy, uh, you know, uh, if there are any cost-related items, how do we move from, let's say, one cloud to another cloud, uh, making sure all our, you know, all our customer requirements and internal requirements are taken care of. Okay. So overall, what we see is, you know, there are multiple personas working within a Kubernetes space. Every persona has uh, requirement from a data protection, data security, data management, data mobility angle, and Trilio addresses all of these different personas, uh, you know, uh, right from the get-go. Now, let's quickly talk about uh, who Trilio is, because you know, we've been talking about uh, the Trilio solution, so it's important to know uh, who we are and where we are coming from. So Trilio was founded in uh, 2013. Uh, we are the leader uh, for data protection for OpenStack Red Hat virtualization. And now we have uh, entered into the Kubernetes market as well. And we are a leader in this space as well. Uh, entire uh, technology is patented. Um, you know, we have uh, built this from ground up. Uh, we have control over each and every 
uh, piece of uh, technology that we uh, you know that we have created so we have you know much more flexibility in terms of how fast we develop and how how much more support we can provide um, we have a global uh, global organization across the globe uh, customers as well you know across the globe in various industries we have a decent amount of uh, Funding. We partner with a lot of different, uh, you know, distribution providers, storage providers, uh, you name them. And then the biggest uh, and the best piece is that our product, you know, has been validated, certified, you know, and has received thumbs up from a bunch of industry uh, vendors using different standards, like you know, that had through Suza Rancher, through VMware, and through IBM. IBM Red had the same same uh, penship now, but uh, we have different certifications from both these engines. Okay, so now let's talk about the Trilio solution. So what Trilio is is it's a multi-cloud data management and a data protection solution. When we say data management, we focus on you know everything related to the data, whether it is you know data uh, you know data captures, data recovering, uh, data security. Uh, you know, data mobility, management, everything. Uh, we are completely distribution agnostic. <clears throat> so no matter where you have installed, uh, you know, wherever you have your Kubernetes environment running, we, we have it protected. You know, we have uh, certified, we have tested, validated all different distributions. We ourselves are a cloud native application that runs within Kubernetes. Okay, so no matter the distro, we will have you covered. From a storage perspective, we leverage CSI. Uh, CSI is the framework to you know communicate for within for, communicate to storage within Kubernetes, and uh, you know we standardize on that uh, framework, and we allow customers to store their data in a backup repository, which can be S3 compatible or NFS. And actually, uh, you know we've just launched now support for Azure Blob and Google Cloud Storage as well. Uh, like any Kubernetes cluster, it's completely you know uh, cloud agnostic. So no matter where your uh, Kubernetes cluster is running, whether it's private cloud, public cloud, uh, you know we have you covered. And then from a package management uh, or an application management, we are completely agnostic to how you build and manage your applications. We have you covered for every kind of use case that you have. So if you are Segregating your applications by namespaces, we can you know manage and capture your applications by namespace. If you're using labels, we can do it by labels as well. If you are using a lot of Helm charts and you want native support for Helm charts, we provide that as well. Again, that's a patented technology. And now operators, which are becoming very very uh, powerful in this Kubernetes space, we have native support to capture your operator as well. You know we have controls over. We want to capture the operator piece, you want to capture the instance of an operator, whatever it may be. Um, you know, we have all these different avenues, all these different uh, ways of protecting your application suited to how you are using it. So what happens basically with Trilio, you know, because of our capturing methodology, no matter where your applications are running and no matter how they are deployed, whether they are pods, PV, secrets, config maps, we capture all of those objects and we move that into a uh, you know remote location which is an object storage or could be an nfs based storage now once it has been captured we take that data and you can restore it into obviously the same namespace you can restore it to another namespace or you can restore it into any other uh, cluster with a separate namespace as well what this overall enables you is basically point in time captures and point in time recovery, right? Uh, there are a lot more features around this overall concept that the Trilio product has been built. And now we are basically evangelizing on this and spearheading the ransomware journey around. So let's look at, you know, what are the cloud native application challenges and, you know, how is Trilio looking at uh, this ransomware uh, Piece and how are we kind of combating it, right? So we look at two ways of entry points that a malicious user can get into the system. One is obviously, you know, getting into the Kubernetes cluster and, you know, getting access to the Trilio console. And, you know, let's say they try to do some bad stuff over there, or it could also be 
you know, getting access to the object storage or the NFS repository where your data is kept, right? Uh, the users can also, or these malicious users can also go there and try to delete your data so that you cannot recover from it, right? So those are the two points of attacks which Trilio focuses on. Obviously, you have your, uh, you know, your primary production data, and that needs to be safeguarded and protected as well. However, the lens that we are coming in from is, you know, we own the secondary storage environment. And how do we make sure that you know we protect this from any kind of attack? And not only protect, but also complement the front end or the you know production primary storage system. So what we have done is you know we looked at a lot of a lot of different uh, you know uh, articles, white papers around you know what what is ransomware? How do you you know protect yourself? How do you fight it? And what we basically standardized on is two, uh, two industry standards, you know, NIST and NCCOE, National Institute of Standards and Technology and the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. We've taken all the best practices from these two organizations, you know, uh, basically they have provided a framework to, you know, approach ransomware and we are basically adopting that to, uh, you know, create a very well curated solution. And what we found out is that ransomware protection is not a single software feature, right? You can't just say that, hey, I have immutable storage and you know I'm protected by ransomware. Yes, you have immutable storage, but that is going to help you from a recovery point of view. You know, you also need to make sure that right from the get-go, your uh, infrastructure is protected, you are able to detect, and so on. Our uh, ransomware protection story is extremely comprehensive and we'll be talking about it you know as we go through this uh, i mentioned this we have aligned the entire solution to nist uh, and nccoe best practices and you know think of these organizations as you know multiple thought leaders who have seen this who have you know worked on these kind of issues for a long time and then they're putting their experience forward for the community to use so what is this you know framework that i keep talking about there are three main pillars to it, identify and protect. What this means is, you know, even before an attack happens, even before, uh, you know, you get breached, you want to make sure that your infrastructure, your applications, whatever you need to protect are protected. You need to understand what is protected, what is not protected. You know, you shouldn't be shocked tomorrow that, hey, oh, I did not know that my app XYZ was not protected and that has been compromised. Detect and mitigate. You want to understand when a ransomware attack is happening. Yes, you have your safeguards and your rails uh, around production storage, but think about your secondary storage where ransomware attackers are going to go to delete it. You want to understand, hey, if someone's trying to delete my uh, point-in-time captures, hey, is someone trying to you know encrypt so my data or you know double encrypt my data? You can encrypt it, and ransomware attackers could double encrypt it. Uh, so you want to make sure that you catch that in real time versus you know just sitting hand over hand and you know waiting for that to happen and then finally is the recoverability aspect where you know you have your immutable backups and you're able to use those to recover right and obviously uh, it's not just you know taking an immutable backup and recovering it you want to make sure that you have isolation testing you are able to actually validate that it's clean and then bring it in Right. So overall, this, these are the things that we are focusing on, you know, not only saying that, hey, an attack has happened, but pushing ourselves, you know, extending what we can do to identify it, to detect it, and then finally recover it from a ransomware attack. Okay, so now let's, let's kind of uh, you know, double click on each of these pillars and kind of go through what, you know, what we're talking about here. We are. So under the identify and protect section, uh, what Trilio has provided is a bunch of different things, right? We have application discovery. So we will look at this, uh, you know, when we do the demo. As part of application discovery, we show you all the applications that you have running in your cluster. You know, we segregate them by namespaces or any other view that you have. And we show you exactly, uh, Mr. Customer, X is protected, Y is not protected, and you know, you need to do something about it. So you are able to understand, you know, get a clean picture of, you know, what is good, what is bad, and what you need to focus on. 
security validations. You know, we've made sure that our product itself is super, super secure, and that is not, uh, you know, providing a point of entry to a malicious user. The way we've done this is, you know, as we mentioned earlier, we've gone through multiple validations, uh, made sure that our technology is solid, made sure the way we have written our code is solid, even, you know, things around linting of the YAML files and validations of, you know, using non-cluster admin roles and things like that. We have basically done um, all of those pieces uh, as part of this solution. Okay. Um, the next piece is obviously, you know, backup immutability that we spoke about, uh, you know, providing immutable backups. That is something that we do. We also provide encryption. And the, the best part about this immutability and encryption piece is that our backup immutability and encryption is at a application level. So you can definitely choose which application you want to make immutable, which you want to encrypt, because you need to understand immutability and encryption come with a cost. Right. If you're going to encrypt everything and you're going to have multiple copies of it, point in time captures of it, you can think about the additional cost that it's going to uh, incur. Yes. You know, if if cost is not the concern, make everything immutable, you know, encrypt everything so that you're well safeguarded. But when we look at things practically, you know, you're always going to want to understand, you know, hey, this data is not that critical and I can not, I don't need an immutable backup on it. I don't need to encrypt it. So you provide all those uh, different pieces, uh, you know, role-based access control through zero trust. Uh, you know, everything uh, that we do is based on role-based access. You know, there is nothing within the Trilio system where a validation is not performed from a zero trust architecture perspective. And, uh, you know, nothing in the system that is, uh, that is taken for granted. You know, everything has a specific owner. Everything is based on, every object is based on uh, a role-based control. Now, from a detect and mitigate, this is this is the most interesting piece. Uh, you know what I feel, what, what what we are doing, and you know we are going to be uh, we are actually working on this, and we are going to be providing it very close to KubeCon. So let's say about four to five weeks. Um, we are going to be looking at the backup data. Now, the way we store our backup data is in an open format. It's a QCOW2 format that we call it. Now, because we own the format and we have full control over it, what we are going to be providing is going to provide uh, abnormal event detection. Now, what are these abnormal events that we are going to be looking for? Let's say we suddenly see your incremental backup size increase. You know, let's say five backups were incremental backups were one GB in size, and suddenly it becomes ten GB in size. If we notice, you know, these kind of uh, uh, events or abnormal behaviors, you know, we'll use some machine learning behind the scenes to flag that. We already have notification and alerts to go into Microsoft uh, Teams, Slack, uh, you know, all the primary tools that we use today. So uh, anytime we see all of this, we will flag that. Let's say we see a lot of different uh, calls to delete backups. Okay, We will flag that as well. You know, we'll use some machine learning again behind the scenes to understand, you know, were these backups really meant to be deleted or, you know, was this uh, authorized user or not? And, you know, we we'll provide all that information as part of notification and alerts too. Containment. Uh, you know, if at all there are, you know, you do notice and you get this notification, you want it to be actionable, right? So we'll provide capabilities which will kind of cut the cords and, uh, we will cut the cord so that nothing can proceed. Your system, your backup system is isolated, right? Let's say the, the attack happening, you cut it short. That is that is the overall idea of detection and mitigation. Um, malware scanning. So what we're doing here is, again, open backup uh, format, no proprietary trillio locking on it. We are going to be providing a bunch of open source scanners that folks can start off using. You know, We understand that not every customer has scanners, all these malware scanning capabilities. So we will provide some of our own, some tools that we have identified, which are going to be so, uh, you know, awesome in this scenario. So we are going to be providing those, but at the same time, we'll be following a BYOS uh, approach as well. A BYOS, bring your own scanner. So again, think about it as data available. We provide the hook, you plug in your scanner and it will scan the backup. So 
Now what will happen is you take a point in time capture that is going to be continuously scanned after it's stored in the backup repository for malware, for ransomware kind of issues, anything. And we will you know, uh, obviously continue uh, enhancing this and you know, curating this for you know, newer, newer things that we see as well. Uh, as part of the malware scanning, you know, that is on the data object or the data volume. What we are doing is we are also going to be looking at your uh, manifest files, your YAML files, right? We will look at those YAML files and tell you are those properly constructed or not. Because what happens is you have, you know, you, people are using GitOps, they are deploying the applications, but when you're troubleshooting certain things, you end and change, you enter the cluster, you run some kubectl commands, you change certain to admin privileges, and then maybe you forget about it. What Trillio will do as part of this malware scanning on the data volume and as part of the you know, YAML read through as well, we will tell you if there are any kind of holes still in your application that you may have forgotten of. So not only at the data level, but at the metadata level. And again, you know, just to summarize this piece, all of these or all this information is going to uh, get into your notification alerts like Slack, uh, Teams, Mattermost, whatever you're using, uh, we have that covered. Now from a recoverability standpoint, right? When you want to recover, the objective is to recover quickly. Right? You don't want to waste time in you know, understanding, hey, how many of my backups have been compromised or you know, which backup do I need to go to? So deep logging is what we are going to be providing. Uh, and that deep logging will tell you exactly which, uh, which backup is clean and which backup you should be using or which hasn't been compromised. Uh, so you know, quickly getting to the uh, point in time capture that you need. Once you have gotten to that point in time, time capture, we already have this isolation testing. You can take that point in time capture, take it into another environment, a test environment, run your security scanners again on top of it, just to ensure, you know, trust, but verify. You can trust Trillio, but do verify that, you know, it actually, uh, actually is properly clean and it hasn't been compromised. Then we have a disaster recovery workflow that's available today. You know, click off a button, whatever, you know, applications have been compromised, you know, you orchestrate that entire workflow. These are the seven apps that were compromised. These are the point in time captures that I want to restore for these seven apps and restore it in this specific order. So the DR workflow lets you do that. And then finally, we have multiple target options. One train of thought is to minimize your attack surface, right? The other train of thought is maximize your recoverability service. So you can have you know, targets in AWS S3, you can have a target in Azure Blob. The chances of all these different targets getting compromised is low. You know, as in when you have more targets, uh, you, know, you, can, you know, can keep extending your recoverability surface so that even if one target is you know, compromised, you have different copies to get to, again, what you want to do is you don't want to pay the ransom. So you just want to make sure that you have insurance over insurance through Trillio to make sure that it happens. Okay. So with that, that's the kind of comprehensive solution that we're building. As we said, detect mitigate is going to be available um, you know, closer to KubeCon, maybe two to three weeks after KubeCon. Um, and most of the pieces and identify protect are there. Recoverability is already there. Um, so um, stay tuned. We are very excited to be providing this and we'll be making a proper announcement for it as well. Okay, so based on what I have said, uh, another poll question, uh, which component does your organization need to focus on today? You know, is it the first one, identify and protect, detect and mitigate, recoverability, all of the above? Uh, you know, are, you, are you seeing that you have one and not the other? You know, uh, more interested in understanding, you know, what is, what is the state of the market and what people feel. So just give, I see the numbers coming in. Uh, just give another 10 to 15 seconds for folks to finish answering. Okay. So what I see is identify and protect 22%, uh, detect, mitigate 9%, recoverability 7%. All of the above 63 percent so uh definitely again the meat of the audience is focused on all of the above aspects 
uh, which which makes sense, right? We want to make sure that we have a, a full fledged approach to combat in ransomware. And this is the approach, not just immutable backups, not just scanning by itself. You want to have a comprehensive solution that can protect you. And again, we don't know when this is going to happen. We need to be ready. And this is the right way of being ready. Okay. Okay. Now let's get into the demo aspect of it. And I'm just going to stop sharing my screen over here. And actually, before going into the demo, I think I can do a couple of questions. Um, I think one of the questions is Trilio scanning for malware is the function being called by another app. So uh, as we mentioned, yes, we will be scanning for malware. We will be providing a couple of uh, open source uh, scanners. If you're interested, you know, we can actually talk about it. Please reach out to me and I can explain which are these scanners and why we are using those. Um, and yeah, and you are free to bring your own scanners as well. Okay, so uh, making sure that it's not just us who is putting our scanners uh, up front, but you can use and bring yours. Uh, is your solution identifying ransomware attack happened? Yes. So uh, yes. So from the detection mitigation uh, angle, we will be identifying. You know, doing these anom anomaly detection pieces things are getting encrypted, someone's trying to delete backups or someone is deleting backups, why is that happening? You know, cutting the cords, all of that, uh, you know, will be provided as well. Okay, so that, oops, uh, that helps answer the questions. Just going to move in the demo side of things. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Or can someone see my scene? If someone can give me a thumbs up. Yep, looks good. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so what you see in front of you is the Trillio World Management Console. Uh, you know, this is, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of live stuff and then some recorded stuff so that we get the whole meat of it and the entire understanding around it. So Management Console, we support multiple ways of authentication. Uh, you know, if you want to use your Kube config, OIDC providers, Google single sign-on. Uh, however, you are interested, I think we provide an extensive, extensive way of authenticating into our management console. Um, I am going to find the Kube config file that I need to use. I will log in over here. I have two clusters created. This is a dev cluster, so I'm not going to touch that for the moment. Uh, I'm going to do be doing all my backups and everything on this cluster. Uh, this is another uh, Kubernetes cluster. It's running in GKE. That was a primary cluster as well. This is your multi-cluster management console. Um, you know, adding a cluster is as easy as clicking plus and you know adding everything. Now, what I'm going to do is just in the interest of time, I'm going to take this uh, namespace. So as you see, we have discovered all your namespaces. I'm going to create a backup. I'm going to use PK plan one as the backup plan. Say continue. I'm going to call this uh, somewhere demo one. Create this. So I'll let this run. Uh, you know, the status logs and everything will start uh, happening in the background. And what we'll now start looking at are these different things that we have within the system. So the first thing I'm going to show you is we'll look at AWS and uh, we'll look at the immutability aspect that we have provided. So ransomware two is the bucket that I'm using. If I look at the properties over here, uh, I see I have a default retention period of one day, okay? And what we do, mapping that uh, backup repository, we have this ransomware two target and we can just uh, click on edit just to see how it's been created. So same information, we say that the bucket that we are going to be using is ransomware2 in AWS. Uh, we provide the region, the URL, and then we have uh, object locking. You know? So we ask the user, hey, is this a target in which you have object locking enabled? And now the beauty of this is once you enable object locking, you cannot disable it. You know, Even if you try to disable it after, it's not going to work. Right, so it's once you enable it, even Trilio has zero controls uh, to do any changes to that. Okay, 
Uh, once you provide that, you provide your AWS secret keys, you know, your access key and your credentials. Uh, and we will go and create this validated. We will make sure that, you know, whatever the requirements are from a locking perspective, they are, uh, you know, they are validated. And then once it's done and available, we will mark it as available for use. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm going to show is that we have something known as a backup plan. Okay. The backup plan, as the name suggests, basically describes where your backup is going, you know, the length of the backups that you want to keep, you know, how often you are scheduling, do you want to do full backups, incremental backups, and the retention policy. Okay. So what we do is based on these inputs that you provide, we end up, you know, calculating the, uh, you know, the retention lock uh, immutability aspect that needs to be applied to your application when it is in the backup repository. So just kind of looking at these things quickly, if you look at the scheduling policy that I'm using, um, the scheduling policy is called, I believe it's TK something. I think it's a test uh, daily one that I'm using over there. And then from a retention perspective, retention PK is the one that I'm using. And what I'm saying is, you know, retain five backups. So the reason why I'm showing all of this is to kind of explain what happens once we basically put the object into the target. So looking at, uh, you know, this uh, environment, we can go back saying that, you know, we've done a bunch of different uh, captures and the one that we started is kind of in progress. So we can filter it based on the backup plan. And we see that there are a bunch of different backups that have happened. Now, interesting thing to notice here is date of expiry. The default retention on the bucket, as we had shown, was one day. When we did these backups, right, we are automatically calculating that and setting it on the system. Okay. So, uh, you know, very, as long as you set a default retention over one day, we will take care of, you know, calculating all the object locking for you, how long it needs to be maintained. When should it be deleted? You know, we, you just don't want to keep a backup, which is, which does not have a retention. So we calculate all of that for you and we work to make sure that it's properly secured and kept. Now, other things that we should look at is certain things like this. So we provide the capability of, you know, viewing uh, YAML files and stuff. You can, uh, you know, we can get the UID of a backup plan. So 55E, let's just keep that in mind. And we can look at the objects. You can see 55E is here. This is the backup plan. And these are the different backups that are uh, within it. Now, um, what we'll do is just for fun, uh, we'll take this UID of the backup. So there's a backup plan. Under the backup plan, you have backup. So we'll take this one, 7652. 7652. And what we'll do is first, we will uh, try and delete it from the management console. So we said there are two ways people are going to be able to access it. Right? So we can go here. We can say delete. Are you sure you want to delete this backup? Yes. So what happens is it's deleted from the system. It's a soft delete, right? We want to let the malicious user know that, hey, you were successful, but technically he hasn't been. What has happened in the backend, your 7652 backup, I'm just going to refresh the screen, is still available. You know, the data is still there and it's not been compromised or it's not been deleted. Yeah. Uh, this backup is also completing, so we'll just go down a few seconds. But again, now obviously we have uh, you know locking enabled on the bucket itself, so you cannot even delete these objects from the bucket. So once the backup has been written, it definitely, definitely cannot be modified. And you know just to kind of do this on the backup that we just created, we can delete this as well. Actually, before that, let's take a look at the YAML to see what the ID was. Uh, it's AE4A, if the folks cannot read it, AE4A, uh, AE4A. Now let's try to delete this.
okay gone from the system but again all these backups or captures are still there on your target repository okay now uh, obviously we have done this for s3 based uh, systems that you know provide object logging now there is a question here that i see you know how do you protect uh, nfs based systems now for nfs based systems you know where all systems which do not have locking what we are doing is uh, you know we are making it kind of like a soft immutability not like hard one uh, the way we are achieving that is as part of every capture that we do you know every backup that we have there is some information about the target that's a repository the backup plan the backup you know the policies and the retention policies and so on so we are looking at the retention policy that the user has applied and if the retention policy does not map or if someone is trying to delete a backup before the retention policy that call wouldn't go forward it just wouldn't happen so any time the a manual delete wouldn't happen only time you'll be able to delete a backup is by the retention schedule kicking in and then deleting it so what that means is through the trilio system or through the backup system nothing can get compromised yes if someone gets access to your nfs storage and tries to nuke that there is nothing that we can do about that but you know obviously uh, you know the way we are handling all permissions credentials and everything it's going to be very very uh, secure and the chances of that happening are very very low okay so that's that's more on the immutability aspect and how all of that works hopefully that made sense uh, what we'll do next is we'll jump into a kind of like a recorded demo just to show how all of this flows from an attacker's perspective and what would happen. So with that, I'm going to share something else. Shout out to uh, my colleague Ben for building this demo. It's a fantastic demo. Uh, which I'll be kind of walking over and talking over. Okay. Let's get started. So what we see is, uh, you know, we're going to kind of describe the environment. We have a Helm application uh, that's, you know, deployed in a namespace called source namespace. We look at all the uh, application objects. We see you, know, you have your service deployments, your replica sets, everything that is powering the application itself. Okay. Um, forward, we look at the PVC. See that there is a you know, there's a stateful workload uh, using a storage class known as HostPath CSI. And next, what we'll do is we'll you know make sure that we have a capture already done. Right. So this is your the user, you know, making sure that they have an application. The application is protected. Okay. So the backup shows that it's available. Uh, you know, it was successfully completed, and it's there. Now, uh, what we'll do is we will look at uh, another namespace called Restore Failover. Now, in this namespace, what we are doing over here, we are showing that nothing has been created. Right. There is no data, nothing at all, and that's where we are going to be. Uh, doing the restore uh, procedure or the restore operation. Okay, so once we are satisfied that there is nothing over there, what we'll do is here is the attacker, right? Let's say someone has come in, he's like he gets access to the service and he's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to go and start encrypt this data and I'm going to ask for money after that. So the user logs in you know, it's assume he has access and we're just showing a simple encryption capability. So this is the, you know, the usernames and the first name and the last name as we're just going to use the SQL encrypt capability, but assume the malicious user is doing something different and you know, trying to obfuscate the data from you. Okay. So now the data has been encrypted and we are no longer able to access it. Now, what happens next is, you know, we we'll just go to the management console again. Uh, we'll take a look at, uh, you know, the application uh, that we had. We will, you know, look at the backup summary. We'll look at, okay, hey, was there a backup that I can restore from? Yes, there is one. Now, uh, what we'll do is we will click on that uh, backup, you know, just make sure that everything uh, happened correctly. You know, 
we do a bunch of different things as part of every capture. So capturing the meta aspects, the requires it. You know, if you want to do application consistency, the snapshot the data, unquires it, data upload, and the metadata upload. Okay. Uh, once you're satisfied, you see, okay, hey, this was an unlocked target. I'm good. I know that uh, I can recover from it. My data is intact. We also provide you a quick summary of the objects that we captured. You know, if you want to do granular restores or you know something intricate within the data itself, we let you control all of that from the console. Okay, so again, uh, we can view the YAML. We can see, you know, verify what has happened over here. Uh, and similarly, you know, we can we can try to emulate that this user is going to go into your object storage and going to try and delete everything. We showed you the soft delete aspect of it, you know, trying to delete it from the uh, Trillio system and the, you know, it deleted it, but the target on the target was still there. And now here, what is happening is, you know, we are going to try and delete as a malicious user, the object itself from the bucket. Uh, you know, it requires you to say permanently delete. And that one is also not going away. So that means, your data is intact and you don't have to worry about anything. Now, the next thing that we'll do, I'm just going to move this forward a bit. Okay. So now that the attack has happened, the next piece is, you know, obviously recovering from it. So re restoring is as easy as, you know, clicking the restore. We spoke about the DR plan workflow. This is looking at it from a single application point of view. You specify the namespace that you want to go into. Restore failover, if you remember, was the namespace that we were showing that there's nothing in. Uh, you know, we say next. We allow you to you know transform, exclude, and add any kind of hooks as part of the restore operation as well. Um, and then once the restore process begins, you can start mapping to see that your application is back up again. Okay. Just give this a couple of more seconds to move forward. Okay, so when the restore is in progress, you can monitor what's happening. We do a validation, firstly, to check that it's good. Uh, data restore, then the metadata restore, and once all of that is done, uh, your application is back up again. Okay, uh, again, just to kind of show you that this was using the lock target, uh, and you know that is where our backup is going. Now, the main piece of this, you know, just fast forwarding it towards the end. Once the restore is complete, what we'll do is, you know, again, we'll connect, uh, connect to the database, you know, making sure we can now check the data. Uh, but before connecting to the database, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, the data is correct. So we we'll list all the objects. We'll see what was restored and how it's looking within the Kubernetes system first. Right, so we'll take a look at all the objects. Okay, all the objects are there. So whatever we saw in the source namespace, all those same pieces have been captured and produced back. Now, because all of this is back, we can you know try to go back to the database and see if our data is clear and intact or not. Again, the way we are going to do that is by port forwarding the MySQL service and then checking against it. Okay, so now that is well, now that we've done the port forwarding, we go back to the SQL instance. We just run the query again. We have to re-authenticate because it's a separate instance. But you run the query, and your data is back to what it was, you know, before the attack happened. So overall procedure, what we did was we showed there was an app. We captured it. Attack happened. Attack uh, tried to delete the backups and everything. Locally, try to delete it from the target, wasn't successful. We came in, we saw that our data is compromised. We took a restore and we are back up online again. Now, again, this is this is just a subset of the things that we spoke about from the PowerPoint, but uh, you know, there are a lot of other pieces that are coming into picture, you know, around the back, backup scanning, the you know, DR plan workflow, um, you know, encryption uh, that complements everything that Trilio is doing around ransomware. Okay, so with that, I conclude the demo pieces. Um, and what we'll do is we'll quickly go through, I see there are a bunch of questions here. 
so I think the first question was what RBAC access Trilio dashboard application needs to access external clusters, config, and multi-cloud Kubernetes uh, cluster. So the way we've uh, built the product, it's fully stateless. And any Kubernetes Trilio, Trilio Vault management console can connect to any other Trilio Vault management console. There is no dependency, all from an RBAC perspective that you require are read permissions over the Trilio custom resource definitions. Okay? As long as you have the read permissions, you will be able to access it. And then if you have read and write permissions and combinations of all of that, you can you know, obviously segment the Trilio solution as well. Uh, by segment, I mean, you can control who has access to policies, who has access to you know, creating backups, who has access to deleting things and all of that. So very, very simple, you know, fully stateless, as long as there's a network path, you just you know, provide the uh, URL of the management console and we'll connect to it. So what are the steps I have to follow to use Trilio solution in my deployment? So uh, we have a very uh, slick documentation website called docs.trilio.io, uh, which explains, or which has a getting started page, uh, shouldn't take you more than, I would say, 10 minutes if you have all your, you know, all the prereqs taken care of, like, you know, a CSI driver and a Kubernetes cluster. As long as you have that 10 minutes, you should be up and, you know, running with uh, TVK. How do you store storage key locally in Trillium? So currently, uh, if we, the way I understand this question is, I, I believe you're asking about the encryption keys. Um, so the way we store that in Trilio is we store it in the namespace where the backup happened uh, as a secret. Now, um, tomorrow, that is, you know, closer to, I would say, Q4 timeframe, late Q4, we are integrating with Vault uh, and, you know, also with uh, AWS KMS. So you will have, or we will be able to, you know, if we are doing any encryption for you, we will be storing and retrieving keys from uh, KMS or key management systems of your choice. Okay. Um, which IDE is used for query? I'm assuming you're talking about the demo. This was just a uh, MySQL IDE, I believe, that was being used. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I'll confirm that and then let you know. And uh, encryption and access keys was the clarification point that was provided. Yes. And that's how. Um, that's how we store it. Currently, we store the keys as secrets, Kubernetes secrets, but uh, we are building integration into solutions like Vault and uh, AWS KMS. Okay, I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to present just the last slide that I have. So this is the slide deck that we were on. Compatibility standpoint, as we said, any Kubernetes distro we'll work on. Storage, CSI is what we need. From a target, this uh, you know we say S3, any S3 compatible device. So it could be AWS S3, MinIO, could be Wasabi, uh, whatever you need. NFS, Azure Blob, and Google Cloud Storage is also available now. Ecosystem, we have direct uh, integration into Prometheus and Grafana. We provide our own Grafana dashboards if you want to use that, and you want to use you know the Trilio monitoring uh, tools. Uh, Prometheus, uh, we automatically send all our metrics to Prometheus, so easy integration as well. We've done a lot of validations across a lot of databases, Postgres, Mongo, Elastic, Influx, you name it. And we continue to build uh, and test and validate all of these. And these are documented on our website as well. And then finally, we live in a very mobile environment. So no matter where, uh, you, know, where you have data, uh, where you have Kubernetes, Trilio will protect it for you. Um, KubeCon, October 13th to 15th, we are going to be there in person. Uh, you know, we are really, really excited to talk about all these different things. And obviously, you know, some really cutting edge features are going to be announced as well. Uh, you know, stop by a booth if you're going to be there. Uh, you know, uh, booth number is P17. You can start scheduling meetings with us now itself. Uh, we are also presenting cost of data management at KubeCon. It's a session that uh, I will be presenting on uh, Thursday, 5 p.m. I believe. Uh, we also have uh, some fun that we're going to be having at the event. So there's a Cube Fest that we are sponsoring. Uh, so definitely, you know, reach out to us if you want to be part of that event. And we are giving away virtual passes as well. So you know, definitely reach out to the Trilio team. 
so with that um thank you for listening uh, 56 minutes i think that was pretty efficient uh, never happened before so uh feel good about that but thank you for listening everyone uh, hopefully this was interesting and uh, you know informative for everyone uh, if there are any additional questions that's my email uh, feel free to reach out to me you can connect with me on linkedin um, or you know twitter uh, whatever is uh, interesting and whatever you use for social media uh, but feel free to you know reach out uh, and let us know what you thought about this session and how Trillio can help you with your needs around ransomware. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Prashanto, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just as a quick reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. Thanks so much. And we hope you'll join us for future webinars. Have a good day.